Hello and welcome to this webinar where we consider Module 1, Part A. My name's Courtney and we're looking at accounting and society. And to frame this and give you a clear picture of how important it is, I want to give you a, a background story that shows you that ethics and governance is all about people's lives. It interacts with money, ethics and the law, and that's why it's important. Sometimes it's a bit dry to read through the materials, but when you can see the impact of poor decisions, poor accounting, poor reporting and conflicted ethics, I think you'll see why it's important. So 12 months ago, there was uh, a lot of discussion in the newspaper about a swimming school and the franchisees from this swimming school were getting really frustrated. For example, one person, they spent $180,000. They were told, if you spend $180,000, you can get this franchise where you run a swimming pool, uh, learning, training sessions. And this one lady spent over $100,000 in rent as well because she had to hold on to a facility. But it didn't come good. Now, when this person was challenged, this person running the franchise, uh, they said, no, everything's fine. Now, the key thing I want to show you here is this person was awarded Emerging Franchisor of the Year in 2016. Probably very entertaining, very exciting, told a great story about how the swim schools would be amazing. You just have to hand over $180,000. And then his excuses were, unfortunately, there's a lot of regulation, there's a lot of third parties. But if you're a franchisor and you're selling swim schools, you are pretty much saying, we will help you do this to run a swim school. You can't just take $180,000 and say, oh, it's much trickier than I realized. There's a lot of problems going on here. So now this all happened in the last 12 months. We have then in the middle of the year, 2019, the, the whole franchise system uh, kind of collapsed, went into administration and got sold off. But here we have 98 franchisees. So 98 different people have forked out over 100,000. Plus, you can see here additions in rent and weren't able to get what they were after. So when we have business and finance and money, you can see how important ethics is, doing the right thing, not just taking people's money, compliance with the law and how it has a real impact so then the ACCC, the corporate regulator, and we'll look at them more in Module 3 and 4, have come out and are taking action against them for misleading and deceptive statements. So we start looking at this idea of ethics. Why did these people make these statements that actually weren't true? And then by the time we get to June, so this has unfolded over several months, we see that investigations are showing that it may have been trading insolvent for up to three years. So here's the Australian franchisee startup of the year in 2016. Now in 2019, when he's tried to be interviewed, he runs away from the camera. So potentially insolvent, well, that's illegal, but also to keep on trading and taking people's money with very limited chance of success is, you know, verging on seriously dishonest. Uh, we have related party transactions and commercial transactions also taking place incredibly disappointing. And what this does is it shows us why studying ethics and governance is so important, because people will cheat to win, to become wealthy, to become powerful, to become successful. Another example is in the automotive industry where they were cheating on the emissions reporting and therefore got you know severely punished when they got caught. But why did they do it? So ethics and governance is a whole list of rules, and ethical guidelines and compliance codes that tell us how we have to operate in business. And now I think you can see why we have to know these rules and why we have to create these rules. Because if we don't, we won't be able to run our businesses legally, ethically, appropriately and protect ourselves from others. So there will always be some people who are willing to break the law, to win, to mislead, to deceive, to cheat, to steal. They will be dishonest. They will try and trick you. Now, imagine a society with no laws. You would be unprotected. You would be vulnerable. And the economy would really suffer. So ethics and governance explains how these people behave, why they are motivated to act in that way. And it's often selfish interests and a desire for more money or wealth or status. And then it says, here are the codes and rules and guidelines that we must operate within to be successful. So your job as a future professional accountant is to help your organisation act in the most appropriate way, but still be successful. So ethical and successful. And how can you personally avoid being unethical or dishonest? So as you read this study guide, ask yourself, 
how is this rule, this guideline, this code, this ethical principle trying to help improve good behaviour or minimise negative behaviour and improve how society operates? And if you have that in mind, I think the study guide will make a lot more sense to you and be a lot more enjoyable for this semester. So here are the subject objectives. And just with this story we've looked at, we look at the role of accountants. So the accountants were helping this franchisee of the year sell these swim schools. Did they do the right thing? Did they allow people to sign up and hand over their life savings, hundreds of thousands of dollars, knowing that it was inappropriate? So what is the responsibility of an accountant in that situation? Is that okay? So that leads us to the importance of ethics, acting honestly, upright, with integrity. Then we saw that the ACCC got involved. So that's our regulatory frameworks, things like corporations law, which prohibits misleading and deceptive conduct. And the corporate regulator who will take action, as well as the, uh, and the consumer protection laws with the misleading and deceptive prohibitions. And then I've got to ask, what about the auditors? Where were they in all of this? Because there's millions of dollars owed uh, in this situation. Were they signing off on things or checking carefully? So just in one story, we see how important it is. And in module one, our focus is on the profession and the roles and the responsibilities of accountants. So as you go through the resources, you should have already seen one of the short videos. I hope you've taken the time to watch that. But follow these steps, answer the questions. And then as you read the study guide, you're going to have a picture in your mind. You're going to have stories and it's going to guide you through step by step to the end of the semester. So our five objectives that you need to master to properly be good at module one are listed here. Now, this is worth 15% of your exam. And so what we can do here is turn these into questions. So the question is, what is the nature and attributes of a profession? So we turn that into a question and you determine if you can answer it. Can you list the eight attributes? Can you talk about the co-regulatory processes? Can you look at the different roles, relationships, activities? What are the four main challenges and then what are the six different things we're doing to lift credibility? And what's the difference between soft and technical skills? If you can do this, then you can effectively earn yourself the first 15% of your marks in your exam. And that's a key point. One, I want you to learn ethics and governance. And two, I want you to perform well this semester. So as a quick overview of module one, it's not a very long module and it starts off with what is a profession and what are professional attributes? From there, we look at regulations in the accounting profession. So you're going to join this profession. How is it going to be regulated? How are you held accountable to the right level? Then we look at accounting and its impact in society. And the example I gave you is, is a very good example of that. When we have a swim school and franchisees and people losing money and heartache and dreams being crushed and stress and pressure, you can see that accounting is not black and white. It has a huge impact. And then credibility. How have accountants lost their credibility through poor behaviour and activity? And what are we doing to increase our credibility to maintain, uh, I guess, a status, hopefully befitting of people who are good and useful and contributing to the public interest? So that's an overview of where we're going. So let's take a moment now to climb into Part A and specifically Sections 1.1 to 1.3. So this is what is a profession. And I, I do like this image. You might be wondering <laughs> what it's about. But the idea of serving the public interest is really important. But we also have to consider our own self-interest. So when we do our work, what does this look like? And we can see here, I love the image of an umbrella and sharing the umbrella because you can look after yourself and keep dry, but you can invite someone else and look after them as well. So at the core of the profession, we need to act in the best interest of society, of others. But we will also receive benefits in return. So it's a bit of a transaction. It's a trade. It's a little, it's not a written down contract, but it's clearly there. So we would hope people act altruistically in the best interest of others, regardless of their self. But the reality is there's going to be some tension as people desire more money. They're going to try and take over the industry, not let anyone else in, because that keeps profits up and become monopolistic. We'll look at that uh, in more detail later. 
So we have this idea of the service ideal, serving the community by providing useful information so they can make good decisions about important financial factors and serving the public interest. Then we have this issue of people trying to take more money than they really need or too much or not being helpful. And this often occurs in the financial planning realm where you give people advice that leads to you getting nice commissions that might not be in the best interest of that client. So that self-interest outweighs that altruistic or public service type of approach. So how important is this? Well, economies and businesses and people and individuals all need accurate information. And when we come to financial information that lead to important decisions, should I buy this house? Should I invest in this business? Should I sell these shares? Where should I put my life savings? These are important. And so we give a proper account of what's going on so that people can make informed decisions. But you can see the temptation to look after ourselves is high. So we want to get that balance between the public interest and self-interest. And so instead of saying, what's in it for me, you should be saying, what are the ethical governance and accountability factors that I need to consider as I make this decision, as I work in this business, as I conduct this audit, as I serve on this committee? Wherever you are doing your accounting work, this should be part of your decision-making mindset. And Table 1.1 gives you a whole list of different organisations and entities that are integrated in this governance, ethics and accountability section. So one of the questions says is, where do organisations like the AASB, the Australian Accounting Standards Board, or the Australian Securities Exchange, or the Australian Tax Office, where do they fit in these areas? Are they linked to accountability or governance or ethics? And so by classifying these in the table, you'll start thinking about these organisations and how they contribute to creating the rules, the frameworks, the regulations that try and minimise that extremely negative behaviour, lift up good behaviour and keep our economies performing extremely well. So more examples have how things have gone wrong. This is from your study guide example 1.1. What happens here is someone made a mistake. The person, and they're a significant senior partner, even a managing director at Pitcher Partners, a a major mid-tier accounting advisory firm. A person made a mistake. They tried to hide that mistake consistently and then they lied about it. When Even when it went to court, they were regarded as a pretty dishonest witness. So here's someone at the top of the accounting profession helping run one of these top firms, lying, acting fraudulently, really dishonestly. Why? Because this mistake cost this bus company. So they were doing a uh, tender and they paid picture partners for consultancy advice to put the costings together to make a quote. And they left something out. And so the quote went in uh, $660,000 per year too low over nine years. So $5.5 million mistake. Okay, now it's terrible. And the systems and processes in that business were not followed and they would have detected the mistake. So one mistake compounded by not having the right systems in place, compounded by trying to lie and cheat and avoid responsibility. So in the end, this was all found out and discovered, but this is what we're trying to avoid. How can accountants have a good reputation when they're willing to cheat and lie and be dishonest about mistakes they've made? So the trial went for 13 days. So here we have a former managing director and partner at this organisation, spent three days under cross-examination, and in the end, he agreed it was an error. It leapt off the page. There should have been a quality assurance of you. We look at this in module one as well. And it wasn't done. Why wasn't it done? Probably to save time and save money. So what we have here is people not doing the right thing for themselves, for the the client, for the public interest. And when you don't follow those processes, disaster unfolds. So what is enlightened self-interest? Back to the umbrella example. What I like about this is you don't have to get wet in order to share the umbrella. There's room for more than one. You can do well and do good. You can look after the public interest and yourself most of the time. But when it's when it's time, when you've made a mistake and you can't own up to it, or when you try and help someone cheat on their tax return, or when you fraudulently present financial statements, then it's not working. Then you're only looking after your self-interest. So Robson and Cooper say, uh, and I've quoted this taken from the study guide, 
in return for power, prestige, getting paid really nicely, that's what happens in the accounting uh, industry, then we have to serve the public interest. So society allows us to accumulate benefits because we are helping society. It's a good trade. So throughout the webinars, I'll stop uh, and give you a chance to answer some questions, see if you've read the study guide or want to grab the study guide out and flick through. So a question will come up. You'll need to pause the recording, take a minute to read it, attempt the question and go from there. So hopefully I've given you enough time to read this question. The four E's of a crowning professionalism. What are they? Which one of these is not correct? So pause it if you need to. Otherwise, time to keep going. So here we see that it's actually expertise. So education, ethics, entrepreneurship, and expertise. So expertise is the fourth E, and excellence comes when you combine this with diligence because you can be an expert, but if you are not careful, if you're rushing or you skip over things, you will make mistakes. And we saw that in the picture partners example. By not having that quality assurance review, a simple mistake would have been detected. I mean, it was a $5 million error. So one of the big risks, though, is entrepreneurship. The more money we try and make, the more tempted we are to grab wealth instead of doing what is right. And so our objectivity, our ability to be unbiased, and even our integrity, our ability to be honest, can be compromised if we focus too much on entrepreneurship. Another example, the Grenfell fire. So there was cladding on a building in the United Kingdom. And it was flammable cladding. Why was it flammable? Because when they built the building, they chose the cheaper option. Why did they choose the cheaper option? Because profits were more important than choosing the material that was right. Now, if you choose flammable cladding on a building, how can all those people escape? And we're seeing this now all around Australia as well. Companies having to spend a lot of money removing old cladding and putting safe cladding up. So in the long term, no one saved any money anyway. They saved £300,000. They have already spent more than £6 million for legal costs. And the legal costs for the organisation that actually made the cladding, £30 million. So instead of making the cladding safe and non-flammable in the first place, we, we chose profits over ethics. And this is what we have to be looking out for. So when you work in a business and they start going down this path, your job is to help them stop and say, this is not going to work out. Do not go down this path. Example 1.2 uh, is another one with excessive fees. And so, you know, to someone being excessively greedy, I guess, to, uh, and trying to pinch from the cookie jar. And a lot of the time they get away with it. But this time they got caught. But instead of charging a fair amount, which was still significant, 3.9 million, they tried to take $5.8 million out of this business. That's $2 million that they hadn't earned, that they took. They took advantage of their power and their position and the weakness of the other parties. And that's just disgraceful. So as you do your accounting professional work, your question should be, is this fair? Is this right? Not, can I get away with it? Another example, and I mentioned earlier, financial planning causes some trouble. We have someone not acting in the best interest of the client. They were pretty much said in the, in the press release they were acting in their own best interest and this wasn't helpful to the client. So these examples keep pointing out what happens when accounting isn't done properly. So now let's take a look at sections 1.4 to 1.8 in part A. Now we're looking at the attributes of a profession. So the first task, you should stop the uh, recording right now and see, without looking at any notes, can you list the eight attributes? But more importantly, can you write a two-sentence description about each one? And why do you need to do this? Because it's one of the key objectives of this module, and that means it's going to be examinable. So I hope you're able to figure them out. Here's a, a mind map or a screenshot that, that captures them all, a body of knowledge, education process, ideal of service, governing body, professional judgment items like that. So take a moment to scan that. And you can see you need to be able to describe the nature and attributes of a profession. This is one of the five objectives, so one worth contributing 15% of your total mark in your exam. 
So if you haven't already explored and navigated, you'll see down the right-hand side, you've got your Get Started Unit, weekly webinars, and then along here, the first two units we've got tie into Part A of Module 1. So you should climb into those units, click on them, and you'll see the instructions. And it'll say, go and read this part, watch this video, attempt this quiz, download a PDF, whatever it might be. And at the end of that section, it'll tell you where you need to read. So that's what you need to do here. Uh, I'm going to go over the attributes of the profession, but of course, there's another detailed video and a worked question and solution to really go into this in more detail. So earlier I talked about this relationship, this deal we have with society. We will give good, useful financial information and that will help people make good decisions and we are rewarded by status and wealth and good opportunities. So this picture shows the trade. We act in the public interest and we get exclusive rights to do the work. So, for example, you have to be a registered auditor. Not anyone can do an audit. So because there's only a small pool of registered auditors, you can, I guess, charge higher fees. You can develop status and prestige because you're of a certain level or qualification. So that's what's taking place. You get more reputation, you get social status, you get more money by doing these things that are appropriate for society. So this is the unwritten contract between the accountants and society. So here are attributes of the profession. I want to go through them just quickly. The body of knowledge. Quiz for you, pause it, have a think, see what you can do. But which of the following does not relate to the body of theory and knowledge? In this case, continuing professional development, still important, and this is what you should be doing with the body of knowledge, but it's actually in a different section, the extensive education process for members. So the three that are correct are theory construction, systematic research, and a well-founded body of knowledge comes from investigation. Why do we account the way that we do? Is there a better way? So if you've ever you know, done activity-based costing and you've looked at your taxes and you've done uh, financial reporting and the conceptual framework, all of those things come back to theory construction and a body of knowledge. So you know, why do we account in a particular way? Is there a better way when we look at accounting standards and techniques and processes? This is how we pull ideas together. This is the most useful way to report. So that's why we don't always use historical cost. Sometimes we use mark to market or, you know, uh, the present value, net present value, different reports for different types of questions. Uh, here's the conceptual framework for financial reporting. So we have a theory that people want useful information that's relevant, but faithfully represents what's going on. And that's tricky to get the balance. Other examples, here's tax accounting, cost accounting. These are all in the body of knowledge. So uh, I guess to reflect on this in the body of knowledge, what was your favourite undergraduate accounting area? Some people are passionate about management accounting. That's sort of me. Others love financial reporting or tax. I know a few people who really enjoy forensic accounting because they like to investigate and, and uncover uh, either fraud or dishonesty or what really took place. Then we have the education process. So you start with your university, then you get your job, you practice and you do your CPA program. And that ongoing CPD, continuing professional development, that's why that question earlier had CPD and it actually comes here. So that's that idea of an ongoing training. You are not just, you don't just finish high school and you're ready to work. You have to skill up and build your capability as a professional. From there, the idea that links to the public interest, this serving of society. So we look after the well-being of society. We pursue excellence, but we also do community service. So we'll often do work for free when we join our local community groups, sporting clubs and charities, when we join committees and act uh, pro bono or you know, for no fee for the service. And that links into building up our social contract. So we want to move away from just being pure professionals whose, whose job it is, is to exploit money and take full advantage uh, to ones who serve the community, build it up and add value to society. From there, autonomy and independence. So uh, the training wheels is the idea of if you want to ride your bike, you can take the training wheels off and you're free to go. We are free to self-regulate. That is the concept of an accounting profession. Now, because of poor behaviour over the last two decades, that autonomy, that freedom has actually been 
constrained. We've had regulations come in and government get much more involved. So this will help uh, test your ability to know the objectives. So you might want to pause this now, see if you can answer it. So there was just a little trick. So the key here was self-regulatory, but you're going to be examined on these five objectives. So you, you notice I keep talking about those objectives. So you need to know them really well because this should be your self-reflection. Do I know the attributes? Do I know why it's no longer self-regulation? Why is it now called co-regulation? And that brings us to objective two, the co-regulatory processes of the accounting profession. Which of the following is not part of the self-regulatory processes or structures of CPA Australia. We need to pause this again. So in this case, rules relating to maximum fees. What's interesting is you might say, but wouldn't be setting a maximum fee be good for the customer? Well, maybe, but we should be able to set fees based on what is appropriate and the value that we create. What's interesting is in the past, there were some rules about setting low fees. You actually couldn't set very low fees. And you might think, well, how can that be good for the customer? Well, if your fees are too low, then you're gonna cut corners to still make a profit. So if you've quoted a low price for an audit, you might not do a proper investigation and therefore that's gonna compromise your public service activity and the quality of your work. So having something too low used to be unethical. That's been removed from the self-regulatory structures, but it's still an important consideration because it can harm your integrity and your objectivity. So our co-regulation, rather than self-regulation, takes the accounting profession and government working together to set the rules for how you will behave and the rules you must follow and the compliance you must do and the ethical guidelines during your career. So we have the Financial Reporting Council. This is a government-appointed organization. So this has been taken away from the accounting profession and they oversee the AASB, the Australian Accounting Standards Board, who set the accounting standards and the AUASB who set the audit standards. Now, previously, these were set by the accounting profession and they were voluntary to comply with. It's been taken away and overseen by government because the accountants lost their credibility and now they are enforced. You have to comply with these standards. So we've got a, a short clip by Tiarshan who explains this in more detail. So please take the time to, to watch that. Next question. Which of the following relating to audit regulation in Australia is most correct? So if you picked A, that's correct, but it's not most correct. There's something that has even more detail and that's something you need to keep an eye on when you do your CPA exams. Sometimes multiple options will be correct statements, but we want to look at the best or the most a lot of the time. So in this case, the extra information here is that auditors must comply with not only the standards, but the code of ethics. It's kind of weird. A code of ethics is normally how you should behave ethically, but in this case, it's kind of become a rule, a regulation, a law for the auditors. And this is because in the past, auditors kept ignoring the standards when they didn't want to. And so it led to poorer quality audits and failures. And then the, you've got to ask yourself, what's the point of an audit if it's no good? So the regulators have stepped in. So slight loss of autonomy uh, in this case. So which of the following, once again, you'll need to pause it, is not a professional body under the control of the government? So the FRC, I mentioned this earlier, is the governing body that oversees the AASB and the AUASB who set the auditing and accounting standards. So it can't be these three. So the professional body not controlled by the government, which means controlled by the accounting profession, is the APESB. So here's a, a, a flow chart that captures it all. The government now looks after the FRC, who looks after the setting of standards. The accounting profession looks after the ethical standards board, which sets APS 110 and other standards. We'll study that more in module two. And who are the main professional bodies, especially in Australia? You have CPA Australia, the Chartered Accountants and the Institute of Public Accountants. So these three professional bodies are more involved in the APS standard setting through APESB 
but they work closely with government to co-regulate the accounting profession. So halfway through the list of the attributes, now we get to the code of ethics. And this gives us a policy of expected behavior and it's APS 110. We spend a good portion of module two exploring it. So I'll just I highlight the fundamental principles. So acting honestly with integrity, being unbiased is objectivity. It's one thing to be skillful. It's another thing to be careful and slow and diligent and do the work rather than just skipping or rushing. Because when we rush, we make mistakes. So that is a, it's really two principles in one. Professional behavior, how we conduct ourselves. So we cannot just disparage others or trash talk. So if you think of boxes and the way they talk to each other before a fight, that's not how we're supposed to behave in the accounting profession. And then maintaining confidentiality. So that's five key principles that accountants adhere to. And we'll look at that more in module two. So the next attribute looks at ethos and culture. Pause this and take a moment to think, which is it? Is it customs, rituals, symbols, values? What's the best description? So in this case, it's the values, the norms, and the symbols. You might be thinking, what are those things? Well, in any profession, there are icons or things we look at that help describe us, help define us. These pictures might help. So accountants are often criticised or mocked and called bean counters. We're famous for having pocket protectors with pens and pencils. That's just sort of our look. Uh, lawyers are known for wearing wigs and gowns. They, When you see someone walking down the street with a wig on, now in normal society, if they wore a wig, you would probably laugh at them, but it's a symbol of what they stand for. And then in religious uh, organisations, so often in Christian organisations, they wear a clerical collar. And it's a symbol, it's a sign of what you stand for. And so these sorts of images, whether positive or negative, create these stereotypes and that sense of ethos and culture. And so accountants have, have this. And one of the key things that uh, CPA Australia, for example, its foundation image, if you've never looked closely before, our founding or underlying ethos is integrity. So the idea should be this. If you ask someone to think about an accountant or describe an accountant, they will say to you, trustworthy, straightforward, honest, without deception, clean, blameless. That's the concept that they'll get. Now, sometimes you ask them about accountants and they go, oh, they're the people who do your tax return or they're the dodgy ones who muck around with the reports to confuse everyone. So we have what we aspire to, but every time we act inappropriately, we also create other norms and symbols of what we're known to be like. So we have a another video clip that I'd encourage you to watch. This one takes about three minutes and it's one of the key attributes, the professional judgment. So you'll see it as you go down our contents listing. We've moved through part A uh, professionals and now we're looking at the specific subsets of co-regulation and judgment in this unit. So what is professional judgment? Well, Lots of people think accounting is black and white. Like, what's the number? Just give me the number. But it doesn't work like that. If you want to work out depreciation rates, you've got to guess the number of years and the rate that it's going to be. If you want to determine an estimate for bad debts, that's a guess. If you want to work out the market value of something that hasn't been sold and you want an estimate, that's a guess. Many, many times we need to use our professional judgment based on history and wisdom and experience. So when is something probable? When it is more likely than less likely? When is it virtually certain? When is it remote? How do we know this? Because this influences where we classify and code things within an organisation and its finances and the story we tell and the future projections and the budgets we create. So we are so much more than just technicians. And computers are going to take over the automatic parts of our job, but the thinking parts and the decision-making parts are ours. And sometimes people say to me, oh, okay, I, I saw in the text that uh, it says you can only do this if it's remote. But so what does that mean? Is that 3% or 6%? You know, in module three, we look at significant shareholdings in a listed company. Now, people always ask me, what's the percentage? And the answer is there is no percentage. It depends on the circumstances. Sometimes 5% is significant, but sometimes 
25% is needed. It depends on the situation and that's why you have to bring in professional judgment. We can't just have arbitrary rules. It's not as simple as that. So judgment is this ability to, to figure out what the problem is, to diagnose. So doctors, if you, if you think about this, they've got to, someone comes in and you have to figure out what they've got. The next important part, though, is to be able to solve. And so one of the things uh, in, in my line of work when we do consulting work is if you visit an organisation, the first thing you've got to do is figure out what the problem is. So is it a problem with costs? Is it a problem with processes and control? Is it a problem with pricing of products? Is it a problem of reporting? What is the underlying issue? Then you sort of got to reach into your toolkit and go, well, in this case, activity-based costing might help or a pricing review might work or customer profitability analysis or a value chain process redesign. These are the two combinations. One, can you see the issue? Two, can you fix the issue. So that's our professional judgment. And the same thing happens in financial reporting. What type of event have we got? And then what is the best way to report on this that is relevant, reliable, faithful representation, understandable, and we piece it together. Air traffic control is another great example of professional judgment, keeping all those planes in the sky, rejigging and planning. And, you know, if someone's low on fuel or the weather pattern comes in, Keeping people alive all day, every day is a critical role. So the final item in the attributes of the profession is the governing body. So CPA Australia is an example of this. So to conclude this section, just a couple of quiz questions and discussion of the idea of the market control view. So which of the following best describes that? So it's definitely not the service ideal because we have the traditional view that says accountants are professional and we do all these good things. We have a body of knowledge, we act ethically, we look after the public interest, all of those. But then there's a market control view that says that's mostly rubbish. Accountants just exist to make themselves richer. We get richer by creating a monopoly. Only BAS agents can do a, these tax returns. Only tax agents and who are registered can do this. Only registered auditors can do this work. As soon as you have a registration requirement, you control who gets in and who doesn't. You can exclude people, which means you can put the price up because it reduces competition. So the market control view says accountants just exist to create wealth for themselves via monopoly. So they are going to say it isn't about public service. It isn't about high quality services. It certainly isn't about competition. Monopoly is the opposite of competition. It's one single provider. So that's the market control view. And sadly, a lot of the examples in the newspaper and what I've shown you in this webinar show that self-interest kicks in. The accountants who worked for the, the Jump franchise, uh, you've got to ask yourself, how much did they know about what's going on? Anderson, another major, this is an auditing firm that collapsed. How did this happen? Well, there was a complete lack of independence. And uh, as, as the text says, this type of example makes it hard to believe in altruism and ethical service and self-regulation. It's pretty much saying when you see how poorly all of these accountants behaved, they cannot be trusted. So that summarizes the eight attributes of the profession and how they piece together. I hope you found that a, a useful summary. So the last part of module one, part A, looks at the profession's regulatory process. So here, we want to look at the idea of what rules can the profession enforce and require you to comply with because you're going to be an accountant. You're going to be, you know, carrying the CPA name uh, and therefore you get the benefits of being a CPA, which is known and respected, but what can be done to discipline you if something goes wrong? So which of the following is not a current professional accounting body? And it is the ICAA. That used to be their name, but then they merged and it's now the C-A-A-N-Z. So with our regulatory processes, we have the Ethical Standards Board and then there's opportunity for disciplining, punishing people and quality assurance. So the APESB, and if you remember the co-regulatory structures, this is controlled by the accounting profession, not government. They can produce uh, standards and 
In 2005, the APESB was established and they published APS 110, amongst other things. And there's another one, 320, quality control for firms. So the quality assurance process looks at how standards are set, are people complying with them, making sure accounting practices are following procedures so they get reviewed and checked. Because if, if you're an accounting practice and you put the CPA badge on your window and on your letterhead, that gives people trust and credibility. They go, oh, you're a CPA, I trust that. So CPA want to make sure that your practice is operating appropriately. Hence, you've got to comply with the quality control uh, manual and be properly regulated. There's also the CPA uh, bylaws and constitution. So complaints can be raised against the CPA. If someone does the wrong thing, you can complain against that CPA and they can be disciplined because that way either they, they stop doing it or they might even have their CPA accreditation removed, which protects the brand name of CPA. So if they get admission the wrong way or they breach the constitution or bylaws or they become insolvent, which is an indicator of incompetence, or if they've been dishonest, then they can be dealt with. So which of the following is not a type of complaint that could be brought against you? And in this case, comparative advertising. In the past, this was prohibited because it wasn't part of the professional behaviour expected of accountants. Now you can compare, but you cannot disparage your competitor and you cannot make false claims. So what happens if there's a complaint? Well, first it needs to be lodged in writing and it goes to the MPC who decides if further action is required or not. And if there is further action, it goes to a PCO, the Professional Conduct Officer. The PCO opens a file, contacts the member who has been complained about because it's not, for, if someone raises a complaint, you need to hear both sides of the story. The investigation takes place and a report goes back to the MPC who makes a recommendation to the CEO of CPA Australia and the CEO determines if there is a case to answer. From there, either no or yes. And if it's yes, it can go in one of two directions, either to a one-person tribunal or a disciplinary tribunal, depending on the level of technicality and severity. Then the ICM gets involved, the investigating case manager who prepares the case. Then there's a hearing, sort of like a court case. It's not going to be as, as formal or structured in that same legal way, but that's the concept. Two sides prepare their arguments, present, and then a determination is made. So what does this look like? Well, there's a bunch of penalties that are available. You're asking the study about to go and read them by going to the CPA Australia Constitution. So some of them are produced here. In, uh, this is 39B, clause 39B, you can forfeit your membership. You can be suspended, you can be fined, admonished, which is scolded or told off, a severe rep reprimand. Uh, you might have your items uh, restricted, cancelled, and you might have to take a quality assurance review. Sometimes you're told to go back and study ethics and governance again because you've shown a lack of ethical ability. So question 1.10 in the study guide asks you to go and found, find an outcome report of people who have been uh, had cases taken against them. And the question says, does it publish the name? And the answer is yes. If, if it's a severe enough situation, your name will be published. And so here's an example. I haven't published the name, but on the 20th of November 2019, someone breached this area. They failed to observe proper standard professional care, skill and competence. They did not obtain a client's written consent uh, to the electronic lodgement of the income tax return. And so this person was ordered to pay $2,520. They were admonished and told to do a quality review. So here's another one, slightly more dramatic. Uh, this person's name was published and it comes up later in the study guide. So that's why I'm happy to share it. But on the 10th of July, 2019, uh, Wayne uh, Armistead breached CPA's constitution. Why? By putting false entries into the accounting system. And they were found guilty in a court of law as well. So they were suspended for three years. Uh, they will have to lose their status from fellow CPA to just CPA. And they have to go and do the ethics and governance segment again as well as paying costs. So this is what you're signing up for when you're becoming a CPA. You are submitting yourself 
to the disciplinary processes, not just of the law courts, which happened uh, over here, but also to the CPA regulatory processes. So that brings us to the end of module one, part A. I hope you found this overview helpful at, at putting a picture in your mind and understanding the material more deeply. So you would have found out more about what are the attributes of the profession, who are the professional bodies, how they work with government to regulate the profession, and what it means to be a professional. So work through these two units, have the short videos and short quizzes. Then once you've done that, complete part B of module one, and then you're ready to do the two module one quizzes. And then it's time to move on to module two. You should have all of this done by the end of week one, because that would be keeping you on track for semester. It's worth 15%. So you've got one to one and a half weeks to get this done. But it's a short semester of only 10 weeks. So remember that and keep on track. Thank you.